Hey y'all, I'm Tara Shaver with AARP's Office of Volunteer Engagement and I am here with Seth Buffelli from our fraud team and today we're keeping it rural on the roost. <laughs> so Seth, tell us all about you. So I've been well, with AARP for about eight years, um, most of it with the um, Minnesota State Office mm -hmm. as Communications Director. In March I started on the Fraud Watch Networks team and I'm working on state state outreach and state support. Um, and this is a place where rural is really important because um, fraud is one of the most popular um, uh, offerings that we have, especially with our rural members. Um, but reaching those communities is, is a struggle sometimes um, just because of size and, and, and proximity to our state offices. Um, I have a little bit of a background, well a lot of background in this. I grew up in a town of about 250 people oh, wow. um, but it was close to a town of about 70,000 people yeah and so the kind of that experience of sort of being from a really really small town um, but also identifying and spending a lot of time in a bigger town that was about 30 minutes away um, really I think you know for me as I as I do outreach work or, or work on outreach work um, I really think about that let's, let's not just focus on the town where we're going let's th think about all those little hamlets those little rural villages yeah. um, that are that are uh, uh, an easy drive, um, where we where we have members who who are interested in our programming as well. Seth inspired me to take a look at uh, at my hometown and to my community and really take a closer look at um, you know what was practical for us. When um, I often will say it was nothing for us to drive to a neighboring town. 40 minutes away twice in one day or <laughs> if you're working on a project and you have to go to Lowe's we were driving you know maybe three times in a day so it was just no big deal and now that I live in the city it's just way different you know like someone really is giving great consideration to driving five miles sometimes yeah. <laughs> because of the length of time it takes them to get there. I always but, called it my uh, going to the movies strategy so everybody's got to go to the movies somewhere yeah. and so where do you go to the movies <laughs> um, if you talk to a smarter person than me like Sean Bosco They'll tell you it's called micropolitan is kind of the, yeah. the, the correct term for it. Actually, if you are if you use AARP map, there's a Walmart filter really? um, that you can click on. It'll show you every town that has a Walmart. A Walmart is sort of like the movies um, if you live in rural America. Yeah. So chances are, you know, if, if you're going to hold an event in a smaller town that's got a Walmart, you have a, a wider proximity where you can also be reaching out to. Yeah, that's for sure. That was, I mean, our commute, we were 10 minutes from from town. <laughs> and, you know, of course, when the Walmart Supercenter came in, that was a big, big deal because then it also brought in people from all other communities that typically wouldn't have necessarily come to our town because we didn't have that much to offer otherwise. But, um, but we had that Walmart, so. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting too, because like sometimes you're in the middle of two towns. We were looking at that map of Alabama before. Yeah. Where you're from, they're almost halfway between Huntsville and Birmingham. So yep. you can sort of go in either direction. Yeah. And you normally do. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, I, I think is that we just have to challenge our mindset because so often we're, we're doing outreach work in our, in our urban communities where our state offices are based. And we're looking at radiuses of like maybe 10, 15 miles. Sometimes to send in that Amos request and ask for a 25 mile radius, the person on the other end says, that's way too big. Um, but really when we get in these rural hub communities, you're talking about like a 45 mile radius. Yeah. People will drive up to an hour. And we've seen this with the scam jams that, that Jay Hoppola holds in, in Minnesota is that he'll, he'll routinely get people that drive from over an hour away to be there for that event because the, the programming is important to them, but they're right. already going there. They're, they might have a doctor's appointment. They, yep. they have shopping they need to do. Maybe they want to go see a movie. Yeah. So it becomes like a day-long outing, and the ARP is part of that. Um, but they don't they don't know about it if we're not reaching out to them and letting them know. Yeah, so I was just sharing with Seth earlier that my we were look, we're still looking at that map of Alabama, and, um, and I'm now in Nashville, and we were talking about some a volunteer that we had, a, a volunteer duo who's still volunteering with the Tennessee office, who live about an hour from Huntsville, Alabama, and about an hour and a half from Nashville. And they go to both places frequently, but they it was routine that they would come and volunteer with us in the Nashville area, all in Middle Tennessee, um, because there's really not much much to offer there where they are, especially not the kinds of activities that we have going on. Um, and it was just one of those conversations that when we started doing some of our requ requests, even for volunteer recruitment, we had to um, 
explain to some of our folks when we were doing the request like hey actually here in this area if you go 60 miles that's about an hour in some of you know just depending on the communities that you're targeting and we said and people driving I mean routinely we have folks here who drive an hour and a half to come into the city um, to work and then they're headed back out to some of those really small towns mm -hmm. um, but they were always eager to stick around if we had a fun event or activity. You know you bring up that example um, and it's interesting because just this summer the Alabama office did a, an event with Frank, Frank Abagnale in yeah. Huntsville and Huntsville is one of those border communities mm -hmm. um, and there's you know so that's important because it brings up kind of an internal roadblock where we have mm -hmm. where there are people on that northern on that Tennessee side of the border who commute into Huntsville every day who are interested in fraud who would be interested in in um, Frank Ab Abagnale but even if if you were the, the the Alabama office and you put in that request for a 50 mile radius your list cuts off at the border right um, because we treat the Tennessee off the Tennessee members as, as sort of the, the property of the Tennessee office right so there are internal barriers to to really offering this local programming but there, there's ways around um, there's a little bit of uh, back and forth you know yeah I think you have to get an email permission from the state director sure. and submit that with your Amos request it's a little bit clunky there's ways around it but you also have to be thinking that way and I, I think sometimes we just don't we're we're so focused on our members but things like fraud things like RX mm -hmm. um, you know certain things you know uh, you know those folks in Tennessee might not want to come down for your state legislative advocacy day. Sure. Um, but if you're doing federal advocacy, if you're doing movies for grown-ups, all those things, um, it really doesn't matter what side of that border you're on. You, it's still relevant to you. Yeah, and that brings up an important part also with, um, so this issue has come up with volunteers where um, sometimes, not just within our state, we're often kind of thinking that they're ours, right? Like, I don't know that they would go over there. I don't know that the office is going to want them to go. But we've had an opportunity uh, when we were, when I was in the Tennessee office, we had an opportunity to do something in East Tennessee. And we reached out to our neighboring states and they had volunteers and staff who came over to help us with this event. <laughs> we're, we're by the landing strip at <laughs> the airport. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of kind of keeping it rural and we're also very close to the airport so um, we were able to fake you off when the airplanes aren't going over um, so yeah so we had people who said you know we'll come over and help you out with this and realize that uh, it was a very large event at a theme park and so people um, obviously are coming from miles around but they're also coming from those states that are connecting in that um, in that uh, meeting point and it has opened up some conversations with us also our colleagues down in Alabama and we said hey if you need someone to go over to Huntsville like we have volunteers who are really close who may even be closer than your closest volunteer um, and I know you guys had that conversation in Minnesota I think with North Dakota is that right you guys had maybe yeah. something on the border and that's a perfect example um, Fargo North Dakota and and Moorhead Minnesota basically share you know there's you don't they're one of those states it's not quite like Kansas City Missouri and Kansas where you right. don't know what side you're on yeah um, but it's almost that side one side of the river is Minnesota one side's North Dakota um, when we're doing advocacy activity in Minnesota it, it's a lot of time is in the winter um, Fargo is about four and a half five hour drive it's usually snowy it's very cold it's just prohibitive yeah. for volunteers to do that um, and, and the North Dakota office has been really generous and smart, you know, the, you know, because they know that those volunteers uh, are going to be available for them as well. And yeah. so, so the, our our volunteers in, in the Moorhead area would routinely go to, to Fargo to get trained on things like you've earned a say, or um, you know, they go to a lot of the movies for grown-ups and stuff like that. Yeah. So, you know, I think there was one thing you were just saying that made me think. Um, you know, another exercise that we did in, in Minnesota that was really kind of enlightening is we had our DAPM folks, um, Jenny Burke, built us a map that plotted all of our, our engagements for a year. Mm -hmm. So people who did pop-ups, um, who stopped by our booth at the State Fair, who, who went to some of our events. And what we thought going into the exercise was that we were going to have a lot of dots clustered really around the Twin Cities, the urban area, mm -hmm. and we did. Um, but what we saw was there was also a cluster in Moorhead where, where people were going to Fargo events. There was also a cluster down in this little town called Luverne in, in, in far southwestern Minnesota where we, we hardly ever go, but they're, they're 45 minutes from, from Sioux Falls. Uh -huh. um, but then we also had dots kind of all over the map and really rural places where we never go. 
And it was kind of this aha moment that if we have this legislative issue where we need a volunteer from, you know, town X where we haven't been in two or three years, it doesn't mean that they haven't been to us. Right. Um, and so doing that analysis, looking for those rural engagements as sort of the starting point, layering in things like the Convio super users um, yeah. is, is really important. We still have more work to do to reach those members, but I think the, there's an impact being made that we don't always recognize because we think that if we don't physically go there, mm -hmm. then nobody does. Mm -hmm. and, and that's another way where, you know, having a, a close relationship with our tax aid volunteers and our driver safety and volunteers are so important because they live in those communities. They've represented those communities year in, year out. When people yeah. think about AARP in those communities, they think about the, those volunteers. Right. Yeah. Um, and those volunteers also have time that they're not always doing taxes. <laughs> That's true. They're not always te teaching driver safety classes. Yeah. So they might not, you know, they might not be interested in everything we have to offer, but we offer a lot of stuff and there's yeah. some fits there. Um, so. Yeah, you were reminded me of a conversation that I had when I was out with the Iowa team um, about I don't know, about a year ago, and um, we were really doing some troubleshooting around some of the volunteer engagement stuff and about uh, their desire to really make sure they were connecting in rural communities. And you gave an example about um, the, you know, are you going to spend all this money to go one time and then not show up again for three years? Like, what does that really do for you? Um, or are there other ways that we can show up? And this was the way we had this conversation where I said, if you went to a couple of those tax aid or driver safety volunteers and said, what are the big events in your community where AARP could show up? <laughs> We could show up there with their help for very little money mm -hmm. um, and then you've created some other opportunities where maybe they have it hasn't been clear to them how they would be involved with the state office outside of those busy times um, because maybe all they saw was advocacy or maybe all they saw was uh, you know stuff happening in the big cities and so um, that really started some wheels turning also about the way that we um, maybe are able to re-engage the people who join us for teletown halls or the people who are doing webinars and things like that where we can provide those opportunities to say if you want to get something going in your community you want AARP to show up like we can help you do that we have volunteers also who are willing to travel which um, is one of the other kind of aha moments that I know that some of our um, colleagues have had is that they they said oh I didn't th oh I didn't think Seth would want to go down to Huntsville you know and it's like well did you ever ask Seth <laughs> No, I didn't. You know, it's like, hey, I'll go. My cousin lives there, you know. Especially if it's February when it's, you know, 20 below where I live. I'm, I'm all in for Huntsville. Yeah, that's true. So it, it opened up that opportunity to think about, like, hey, if you have this person who loves to do, you know, fraud or loves to do movies for grownups and they're willing to go, um, they, that might also increase some capacity with um, and provide some additional opportunities for volunteers to lead by letting them go help out um, maybe in your own communities, but also maybe with a neighboring state. And uh, we were just having this conversation conversation earlier about some of the lead volunteers for fraud and um, we've had a couple of other inquiries this is a very hot topic this week <laughs> I just had some other inquiries saying uh, okay we've got this group of people who we know are interested in and in willing and uh, that we have our eyes on for leadership they're like how can we help them develop their skills and be ready to step out as AARP leaders and that's of course what the Office of Volunteer Engagement can help with the Office of Community Engagement can help with but it's also one of those things that we realized as we were like throwing some ideas out that we can be helping each other with and just as I was walking out the door I had an email from our friends in Maryland who were literally putting together a training for some of their potential volunteer leaders to just give them some of the skills and like talk about how they might you know do their work in their communities and that kind of um, collaboration and sharing is, I, I don't know, I feel like it's a little easier than it was maybe when I first came to AARP. When we were, we were just so focused on, um, uh, on just, I, I always call it like being on the hamster wheel, right? Like we're just on the hamster wheel running and just kind of doing stuff, everything that came our way, we were feeling like we had to tackle that. And I feel like we were, we we're um, having an opportunity to pause and reflect on what we're doing and be a little more strategic about that and find out where we could not reinvent the wheel. Yeah, you know, I think that that's a big opportunity and something we haven't historically done well is that sort of horizontal information sharing. Yeah. We're good, you know, good top down. We're even good bottom up. We just don't share across. And I think it's through work that, that, that your office is doing, OCE is doing great. We're really trying to emulate it in the, in the fraud shop. Yeah. It's just sharing, everybody's having the same experiences. Mm -hmm. And just making sure that those those best practices and those those light bulb ideas are sort of getting shared across the organization. You know, one thing that you mentioned um, is Iowa, and they're doing really great work around fraud. Mm -hmm. they're, they've conceptualized this. There's 99 counties in Iowa. 
And if you're running for president, there's this goofy thing where you're supposed to go to all 99 counties to show that like, you're legit. <laughs> but it doesn't make sense because a lot of those counties just aren't really that big. Yeah. They don't have that many. If you're a Democrat, they're not Democratic. Or if you're a Republican, they're not Republican. It's just kind of a silly exercise. So the Iowa office is like, well, let's take a page from them and let's go to 99 offices. And I was like, do you know how many times you have to go into CVent to pull that off? Um, but they're, I mean, they're a great team and they're thinking outside the box and they yeah. really kind of dove into this re-engagement data yeah. and these micropolitans to say like, can we reach, instead of trying to go to 99 offices or state or county, sorry, let's try to draw an engagement uh -huh. out of 99 counties. So if you have one county that has five around it, try to get five counties to come to your one county event. Yeah. And Julie Betts has really kind of worked um, on the map tool quite a bit and, and Connie Eastman has been in there too. And so they have some looks like, let's, let's try to do this. Let's try to do 30 events and see if we can get to 99 county engagements out of that. And I really think it's important in rural communities to really work that re-engagement data. Yep. And I know that like talking about engagement is something that really grinds people's <laughs> ears. Right. Um, you know, I'll be the first person to say that like my favorite saying was, if a tree falls in the woods, it didn't really happen unless it got logged into c -Vent. Right. Um, but you know, th this conversation is starting about quality engagement. Looking right. For, looking for that person that got their taxes done. Looking for that person that that is a went to a driver safety class. Yeah somebody that had a fun experience at a movie for grown-ups or who like signed a RX petition finding mm -hmm. those not just you know not just somebody who like signed a sweepstakes to win a micro shredder but somebody who 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 went to a Frank Frank Abagnale who yeah. had an experience with AARP and then came back and mm -hmm. then came back again and that those are your really hot leads those are the people um, that where we're making an impact in these rural yeah, thanks for reminding me also that Iowa did a kind of use a similar approach when they were doing some volunteer recruitment and I believe they scheduled maybe three events all around and um, it might have been more than that. And they were like, wow, we were overwhelmed with how um, many people not only registered but showed up and it was by employing some of those strategies that, um, you know, we I, I know some folks may be quick to catch on to do it for events because they are either suppressing, I don't want to see you if I've seen you before, or <laughs> I want to see you, uh, you know, I want to see you again because we've seen you before, but I want to create a, maybe a deeper experience. So I had to smile and you just said, hey, we looked at our data and it was everywhere. We did a volunteer recruitment by email um, back when we first had access to email, like through <laughs> through AARP, not in the world, but through AARP. And we uh, were just hoping for a fair response. The last time we'd done like a um, paper mailing, I think we got like six interest forms mm -hmm. back or six, you know, inquiries and like four of them were Lulu's and like that we weren't going to do anything with them. Um, so we were just hoping for a fair response that would give us some opportunity to like talk to some folks who might volunteer. Overnight, we had almost 200 responses. And when we were seeing where people were from, we're like, these people are literally from everywhere. So we got a giant map and we started plotting them just by like, let's just see where they are. You could not have just thrown like marbles down and had a better scatter. They were everywhere and they were interested in working with us. And at that time, we had not figured out some of the ways that we could have involved our volunteers, our potential volunteers in these areas where we were never ever gonna get there. Like we had not thought about it. And, um, and I think that really had my brain uh, in, in motion thinking about what are the things we do where people wouldn't have to be in an office or they don't have to physically come up. And we've had some success um, with the AARP live show with volunteers who help us with call screening for teletown halls. And um, it's been a really fun experiment, but it's been really successful. And I've been surprised um, in talking with the folks who are helping us with the show that they've said just what you said about like they came and volunteered with AARP virtually they've never met me in person they've never met any of our other folks they've never come out to an AARP event because it's not convenient for them and they are like I've had such a great experience volunteering in this way and that just is like it, it really reframes the way we also think about how we might um, work with folks as we continue to kind of you know work in community but also um, as more people see what we're doing and they want it in their community or they want to be part of it thinking about what are the creative ways that we could ask people to help us even if they're out in you know uh, Centerville Tennessee which is very far from everything <laughs> yeah you know and I think if you read the like big think pieces about you know the keys to reaching boomer mm -hmm. volunteers it's all the things we offer giving them an opportunity to be a leader uh -huh. giving them an opportunity to use their skill set that they've developed mm -hmm. um, 
giving them a chance to be a sporadic volunteer right uh, and giving them a chance to work remotely I mean we have all of those that's basically a description of what it means to be an AARP volunteer right yeah um, and so just because you are in a rural community hey if you got a phone line and an internet you can you can you can do any of the work that all the other volunteers who maybe live in the urban center do right yeah and that brings up an important um, uh, conversation that I'm going to have later with Jen Beyer um, about technology and about some of the kind of workarounds and hacks around technology because we know that that's still an issue for some folks. So even if it's just that it's cost prohibitive, um, we've got some creative solutions which we can talk about later. But um, yeah, so tell me what else is on your mind when you think about now that you're in uh, with the fraud team, like what have you, how, how has this all been coming together for you to think about your work with the team and is it mostly in consult with the states about how they approach their work or is it giving you guys some ideas? is for um, our fraud work in general. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, this kind of lends into what, how cool this thing that we're doing here is. Right. Is that the one thing I see, and it's not a surprise to me because I spent eight years in the state office, it's just we are really, you know, our state offices are, are stretched to the max. Um, yeah. And, and it, you know, we, we've done things over the years to create more capacity, but there's just more demand, you know. And I've been in that same spot in the state office. It's like, Oh, we got a new person and we have all this extra stuff well that's great because i have five things that i want to start doing now and then you implement those five things and so finding ways to sort of shorten the curve for them mm -hmm. things like this like a podcast that like you know i get so many out of office messages and not that i'm on vacation i'm out of office on association travel i right. get like 10 of those a week yeah and i get it you know so like something that you can download and you can listen to while you're driving to mm -hmm. the next event is really smart and that's what I'm really focused on, especially now when we're in state planning season. Is what are the resources that we can put together that really takes that best practice sharing? It, it, the monthly calls are great, but something that doesn't require you to wait for a month and then you know be on be on WebEx for an hour. Right. Something that's accessible that you can reach. You know, something like one of the things we really see an opportunity in fraud is to do more pre-registration in-person events. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't have to be at a like thousand person Frank Abagnale scale, right. but it can be at a two or 300 um, person. And we have a, a, just so many different speakers that can, that can fill that bill. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we're working on is a, a speaker's bureau. Mm -hmm. So here are 15, 20 names that we've vetted. Some of them are just your colleagues mm -hmm. um, or really, or some of them are great volunteers. But you know, if you want somebody to come in and speak for 20, 30 minutes and do some Q and A on fraud, you know, I guarantee you that's going to put 100, 150 people butts in the seat. Right. Um, and so, but I think a lot of times we're just so busy in the state office that like, yeah, I'd like to do that, but I don't know where I'm going to find the person, you know, and all the, like all these things that um, just because of our reality um, be, become sort of like off the table for us. We're yeah. just trying to, to do whatever we can to try to make that more achievable. Yeah, you made me think about something we've been talking about with our team a lot, which is like, okay, you're doing all these great things that you already do well and you know how to do them. And perhaps you're still like holding all the balls and you're still doing it all yourself. Or maybe, you know, volunteers have roles, but they're maybe not um, owning it all yet. Is that like those things that are already so well orchestrated and um, figured out that they can be replicated. Like do some more if you've got volunteers who are equipped to do it so that they can just go make those things happen so that it frees up some space for you to tackle some of the stuff that maybe is new that you're wanting to tackle so it's not just more stuff on the plate and that ever ending question of what do we stop i don't know that anyone if anybody's figured out what do we stop <laughs> well because like yeah let us know because i i've only heard maybe one or two examples of late of things that have been stopped I think it's a question of what do we stop and then what are the things we're not going to start next. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it is what it is. And I'll admit, like, I was, you know, I was once a volunteer's can't person. Uh-huh. Um, and the, the best case was the, the iPads. Uh-huh. Like, well, we're just going to do the paper forms because volunteers, see events a pain in the butt. Yeah. And they can't do that. And then we used it once. And then every time I showed up with paper forms, they would say, where are the tablets? <laughs> so, you know, and I see that in, like, some of the top performing states on fraud they yeah. they they don't just have volunteers who give presentations or volunteers who like call into monthly meetings they have volunteers who are actively engaged in leading the program yeah um and that's important and i think that's that's where we all want to get to yeah i agree and i think that uh, another conversation that's been going on and that's a, such a great example i had the same experience with the first time we used them everyone's like give me a device like yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, so we're logging in on all of our devices to make sure everybody can help make that happen, um, is that, you know, volunteers helping other volunteers get comfortable with some of the stuff mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a formal, like, mentor process, and it doesn't have to be a big deal, and nobody has to, like, schedule some kind of big half-day training to know how to use the iPad to check people in. It can literally happen, like, on the job. Like, hey, show up a few minutes early. I'm going to show you how to use this. Flag me down if you have a problem so I can come over and give you a hand if <laughs> If it logs out in the middle of the, you know, registration or something. Yeah, and I think the thing is, you said it before, is don't be afraid to call somebody. Yeah. So, like, this was this big hang-up I was having, um, and I couldn't quite get over it. I don't have the time to train volunteers on, on a platform I really don't understand. And yeah. so it was really Kathy McClear who said, I'm going to call Trey Holloway. I'm going to call the state support team. Yeah. And they sent people out who did it for us, <laughs> you know. They, you know, and it was awesome. And, yeah. And then once I got myself out of the way then it just happens and yeah. sometimes that's just what we have to do yeah so. i absolutely agree and i think that either if people are really direct that's great and sometimes they're just really gentle with it so you need to hear the message when they say like you're 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 the bottleneck you're causing the yeah. problem you're the one who is wow. getting in the way um and sometimes that's even with um, you know back to the travel and the going to rural communities um i've told this story before but my i had a volunteer team that's four and a half hours away from here in nashville um, they're they're on the uh, actually they have a city that shares the Virginia border Bristol um, but that Tri-Cities area there um, I was going up to try to facilitate meetings like every other month or something and they said it's really expensive and time-consuming for you to come here we don't need you for our like every other month meeting or our monthly meeting they said can can we like just redirect some funds to be able to like try something in our community that gives us more to do and more of an more of a presence here and this was back before we ever started any of our ECP or official CP work and I thought why not like let's just try it and the kinds of stuff that they were able to come up with first of all would have I don't even know that it would have ever been stuff we would identify but they were also so much more um, budget conscious than we are yeah. and that was the conversation that Anthony in Iowa and I had about uh, that community I said I bet you anything if this if some the volunteer comes to you or the potential volunteer comes to you with the idea that whatever they have proposed is going to be about a tenth of the cost of what we would have probably mm -hmm. spent to try to do something there um, and it's probably more meaningful not just to the the volunteer or the, the potential volunteer but it's also more meaningful to the community um, than then us just kind of you know swooping in and having one of those one-offs and then coming back around whenever we get back around <laughs> so. no yeah I think that's true the ownership but I think the other thing is like nobody knows better what their capacity and what their volume and cadence is than yeah. they do. Yeah. You know, so I think it's hard for us, especially at P State Planning Sound, to say, I think we should do three events every quarter down there. That might be a fraction of what the local team can do, and it yeah. might be more than the local team. It's yeah. really kind of giving them the reins um, yeah. and, and sort of giving them the, the resources and the playbook and, and, and letting them take it. Take it to yeah. Them. That's an excellent, um, yeah, an excellent comment. I was just talking with Amber um, in Virginia uh, last week and she was mentioning her team and how the team how many events the team is doing now and I want to say she said 450 events a year I may be off on that but it was close and my mouth dropped because I remember thinking you know there's no way in the world even with with great volunteers at kind of a different time at AERP that we had that much going on because we were doing more of those larger scale events and we were trying to look for some of the larger numbers or or these big sponsorships that maybe weren't getting us the engagement or the volunteer opportunities um, and so realizing when they're showing up and they're saying oh yeah I can take that um, it's also I, I think they've been great to help us in um, the Dallas team has a great example of this where they say they have like this calendar monitor who who will do the team check-in when they have new proposals mm -hmm. coming their way and she'll say there's no way we can do that this week we have got you know we're double booked five out of the seven days of this week there's just no way we can do it we need to just consider it for next year and um, and that I think is one of the big learnings for me as a staff member coming from I worked with volunteers in a different way in my previous um, role before coming to AARP was recognizing that sometimes they give us a really big reality check about capacity yeah <laughs> Sometimes it's, we could be doing more, but a lot of times it's like, are you crazy? This is a really crazy week and, you know, we're all going to be all hands on deck and we're all going to be exhausted and we're going to need some recovery time, so. Well, here's an interesting story along those lines. In Washington State, they have an incredible team of volunteers who are out giving fraud presentations mm -hmm. and they're building their own schedules. What was happening is that they were just generating so much 
volume and so much work that it was becoming, you know, kind of an issue for the staff because all the stuff has to go into the and it all has to be logged and all that sort of stuff. And so, so Doug Chadell and um, Amanda, they, you know, they went to Doug and said, we need the extra help. Doug went out and, and brought in Ashley and her job is just to support the work that the volunteers are doing in the ground. And, the, and it could have been one of those ones that you could have said, well, we don't have any more positions. Somebody else is going to have to do it. Right. But in that, in that situation, like it was so important because it was volunteer led that the state director made it a priority and found yeah. out how to get the resources. And that means the world of those volunteers because like they were supported, like they, yep. you know, the, their work was not only recognized, um, but it was supported in, in having her on board. The other thing that Ashley does too is she, um, she does, she calls through. So they, they know that they'll go anywhere they want to go. So she'll make the phone calls to identify places ah, um, where the speakers could go. Okay. Um, so there's, I mean, I, I think that's a that's a great example of sort of the volunteers creating this, the, the, the demand. Yeah. Um, and then the state following following with the, yeah. with the supply. So. And there are so many ways that that could work itself out. And I know even between teams of volunteers, my um, my previous volunteer partner, um, or my, my next to last volunteer partner, and then my last volunteer partner when I was in the state office, had two very different approaches to the work and like the kinds of stuff that they wanted to do and that they found enjoyable. And so also kind of like a recalibration uh, periodically within the team to say like is there is there something we need help with first of all but is there also something we're still hanging on to that you know a volunteer team can take over and some of, some of this is going on with the Minnesota team right now about um, rolling out and revitalizing their speakers bureau um, and really helping create some roles and positions as you were talking about uh, the things that Ashley does trying to identify some places they're looking at that sort of thing as well like where okay so we have a team of volunteers maybe they're not the presenters but they're still working with the speakers team and they're helping identify locations or they're helping with registrations and with um, with check-in um, and so um, you know we'll be telling some more of those stories later on as we continue with this uh, with the roost but um, it's been really cool to see how folks have said hey we think we've got enough we think we've got enough going on here that we can create some new roles that we never even thought about um, and that everyone you know on the speakers team doesn't even have to be a speaker like there are just some really yeah. creative ways to think about um, how to do how to do the work a little bit differently and to create some opportunities. Connecticut does a really good job of that with their volunteers where they, they put them in teams. Yeah. You know, so, you know, we've all been there in front of a room where we're, we set up the AV. <laughs> yep. We check people in. We're giving the presentation. Um, five people are going to come to ask us a question. And we're also trying to walk out of there with some, like, count me in cards. Like, yeah. just, as a staff member, it's overwhelming. As a volunteer, that makes them run for the doors. Yeah. Uh, but when you have that team approach, where there's five of us and I don't really want to give the speech but I'll check people in or like I'm I'm cool answering questions or somebody else is the chattiest person in the world so that's who we're gonna send <laughs> after the live bodies who might want to be volunteers and I mean that approach I think hands down states that take that that, that have that approach um, cover more territory yeah um, get more events and I, this gets back to the the whole engagement question is that I think state state planning is a good time to think about it because yeah. it's like that quality versus quantity, and I think we're starting to get there. Um, but you know, those 450 community presentations that that Amber was talking about in Virginia, I'm just going to go out on a limb that says the majority of them don't include, you know, engagement data. Mm -hmm. But so what? Mm -hmm. Like those are people who sit down, who have an experience, who learn something. And not, not just learn something from us, but learn something from a peer, which studies right. show actually sticks in their mind longer. Yep. Those 450 events are much more valuable than like a sweepstakes at a senior fair. Yeah. Um, where somebody comes to it and gets a tchotchke and signs in the iPad. But I think internally we value those sweepstakes more because that generates 500 engagements. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's just this thing that we have to always remind ourselves, where are we making the real impact? And if we can start to gather more, more right. uh, data of those things, that that's <laughs> <Super>. <laughs> great. But like, we shouldn't forget that we're actually making an impact by doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the other thing that does, and I, I was smiling as you were talking because I was like, oh, this is the, the. Um, I had two volunteers who really liked to volunteer together. And again, this was before we were even quite doing team team stuff and I I encouraged it because I knew they were gonna do more if they could do it together then you know I might have to really 
beg them to do one thing alone and they're going to do five things if they were able to do it together. Um, that that also builds the, the sense of um, teamwork more quickly and that um, and more solidly. So, you know, because there's also that there's that all the stuff that happens in between the actual work, right? Like there's the car ride or there's the setup or there's the, you know, the time that they, they go grab a coffee or something afterwards. And um, that just continues to gel the team more, which I think um, it strengthens the whole, all of the work that they're doing, but that helps them, you know, be more energized to continue say, looking for opportunities. And, um, and that's the way those teams start to really gel and start to act like a team and not just people who were assigned to a spot on a list or on yeah. a, you know, on a sign up sheet. So, well, Seth, it's been awesome. I think I have no idea what time it is. I think we, <laughs> I think we have to go. So is there anything else you can think of in terms of just what, uh, kind of what you dug up when you were preparing your AARP talk? No, I mean, I think we covered a lot of that. Yeah. And, I mean, I think the thing is, is that when we talk about, you know, we're very focused on local, mm -hmm. but that means a lot of different things to a lot of different yeah. You know, if you're in D.C., local means, you know, it means not just 15 miles away, that means five miles away. Yeah. Um, you know, in L.A., going 15 miles would take an hour and a half. Um, yeah. But local in a rural community means the little town you grow up in. It also means the town you went to school in. It might mean the next town up where you go to the, the, the hospital or the yeah. clinic. You could identify with two different towns. And so, like, um, leaning on that sort of institutional knowledge of the state staff um, and, and just thinking, you know, putting yourself in that place. Yeah. You know, would I drive 45 miles to go to this event? Well, chances are I already do. Yeah. Um, and so, and I think some that, sometimes that's where we have to be the override um, to our partners in DC who will say like, are you really sure you want to go further out than 25 miles? Yeah, because that's the lived experience yep. out here. So. Yeah, and I think that brings up an important point about uh, also the volunteer angle of that, which is a consideration, but I don't think it should be a barrier is where folks have not been accustomed to having volunteers travel longer distances and they're worried about mileage or rooms or any of those kinds of things. It's like reach out to your OVE advisor um, to talk that through. Um, that's where we can sometimes help you get some support um, or figure out how to have that conversation again during state planning time is the perfect time to be saying you know could we be looking at things a little bit differently and we really advocate for also letting community um, teams and your volunteers as you're building out in a community have a bit of a budget to work with so if you know that going into planning and you know that um, as you start to kind of set your agenda for the next year um, then that also kind of changes the conversation instead of it being an afterthought once you know you're we've already got everything planned there's no more money left to give um, just to do that now and, and leave a little wiggle room for some of those opportunities. So, For sure. Seth, thanks so much for joining hey, me. Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> I feel like Bartles and James I are going to crack some wine coolers. So. <laughs> I'm going to have to come back out here. I'm like, I really like this shot. It's great. Um, we're at a great, great, great place here um, in Nashville that is the home of the Tennessee Historical Commission. And they just have a beautiful property that sits back off the road. So other than the airplanes, which apparently are all landing right here while we're talking today, um, they have a gorgeous property with some historic buildings. And so lots of eye candy for uh, for the rural, the rural edition of the roost. So thanks everybody for tuning in and for watching and we'll see you next time.